Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to this event sponsored by the UCLA Law, Resnick Center for Food Law and Policy, and the Promise Institute. And we're presenting the title, A Global Perspective on Regulating and Promoting Nutrition. And we're so pleased to have with us the Honorable Jose Graziana da Silva, who is the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations with us. Um, I have to apologize to him. I promised him we'd have sunny, beautiful weather. <laughs> I broke my promise, but he still came, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, before I moved to Los Angeles, I had the privilege of of being a visiting scholar and then a consultant in the legal department at FAO, FAO as we call it, FAO in Rome. And my favorite experience was riding the elevator. Because when I get on the elevator, I would hear six to seven different foreign languages being spoken at one time. And that was always a, a, an, interesting, <laughs> an interesting way to experience uh, uh, working at FAO. Um, this is a very, very important organization. And, um, and we're so gratified to have uh, um, the Director General here with us. He met with the Pope the other day, and that's one of the reasons this conference was moved to a Friday, which is really an awkward time to have an event, especially before a holiday. <laughs> but we're very grateful to have uh, such a great turnout, as, uh, notwithstanding uh, our timing. Uh, we have some, um, I'd like to introduce the folks that are going to be participating. And, um, and then I'll turn the time over uh, to our first, uh, a few remarks by our dean. So let me go ahead and introduce uh, Dean Jennifer Manukin, uh, who's also the David G. Price and Dallas P. Price Professor of Law. She's been, uh, she became the dean in August of 2015. She has an amazing background and credentials, and everyone on the program does, and so in order to save some time, I'm not going to mention all of the accolades, but I do want to say that she has a, a wonderful distinction of being able to be in, in all places at the same time, and she's showing that skill off today, <laughs> so we're very grateful to have her uh, with us. She's also, it's always wonderful to, as a working in a food law center to have a dean who actually sends out spices as Christmas gifts. <laughs> and so uh, uh, in her heart, I know that we are her favorite program because of her Christmas gift. Um, but at any rate, we're delighted to have her. And we're going, and when I finish, she's going to take five minutes or so and uh, issue a general welcome to the audience. We're also uh, happy to have uh, Halal Elver with us, who's the um, UCLA Global Distinguished Fellow and a Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food uh, appointment by the United Nations Human Rights Council. And, uh, and she's been a great, a great compliment to our center here at UCLA as well as to the Promise Institute. Um, the closing remarks, and we'll have kind of a wrap-up session, uh, will be delivered by our own Asla Bali, Professor of Law. Raise your hand so everyone can see you. Thank you. Uh, who's also the director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights and the director of the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies. Um, and then I want to thank all of you. And uh, now, given the style of um, the Director General's presentations, he's going to leave you with plenty of time to ask questions. And so those of us who are directors and involved at law school have our own questions, and we'll invite audience discussion as well. I think that's what you prefer doing, isn't it, Director General? He, He's very much a man of the academy and likes to discuss issues and answer questions. So without further ado, uh, again, I want to thank you for joining us. And I will now uh, turn the time over to Dean Manu. You can hear me, right? Yes. Uh, so really, I'm just here to say welcome. This is a crazy day today at the law school. Um, and it's a holiday weekend. And it's one of these days where we have five tremendously important things all happening at the same time. And so I really want to be Hermione Granger from Harry Potter and have a time turner so that I could be fully present at every one of them instead of just popping in and saying hello and then having to hear later about what I missed. But I at least wanted to be able to pop in and say hello and welcome to all of you because we're so honored um, to have 
uh, this opportunity today uh, uh, to have Jose Graziano de Silva with us. Um, and so first and foremost, uh, Director General, I want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you for coming to UCLA and giving us this opportunity to hear from you and to have this conversation. And let's give you an initial round of applause for you. Today's presentation on the right to food and the global agenda to reverse hunger and malnutrition is sponsored by, co-sponsored by two fabulous programs within UCLA. Uh, the Resnick Center for Food Law and Policy, um, which Michael Roberts uh, is the executive director uh, of, and several of his board members and supporters of the program are in the room with us, as well as the Paulus Institute uh, for Human Rights, um, which is also another one of our wonderful institutes. And so it always um, warms my heart when programs can also come together with such fabulous programming. Um, and uh, so it's terrific to see you guys working together and bringing, um, bringing, bringing uh, these kinds of opportunities to our community. Um, so thanks to all, both of your centers and programs. Um, and Kate McIntosh is the executive director of the Promise Institute, also in the front row. Um, and it's a really important subject. Um, I mean, I think about uh, the images that we sometimes see, um, you know, that can be they can make this sometimes feel as if it's a subject that's important but distant and far away. Um, you know, when I was a young child, you know, my mother would try to get me to eat my broccoli with 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 plaintive pleas about you know starving children somewhere, or we'd seen uh, or you'll see charitable requests with celebrities talking about this as if it's an issue that's far away and across the globe. And of course, it is that, but it is not only that. It is also an issue that is far, far closer to home. The USDA recently concluded that 15 million American households were food insecure in 2017. That's roughly one in eight. And so yes, it's happening across the world, and that's important, but it's also happening here in the US, here in Los Angeles, here within the UC system. In fact, the University of California has, uh, has estimated that a not insignificant percentage of UC students are food insecure at some point during their studies here. And um, that's part of why they've created a global food initiative to take this issue and set of concerns seriously. And it's not urgent only because it's a local problem, but it's important to recognize and understand that it is both a global problem and a local one. And so I think this is a really important topic and set of issues for us to be looking at. Um, and I'm glad that we have the opportunity to do that here and to begin to do that a little bit today um, and so that we can all be partners in trying to help reach the stated goal of the UN's FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, quote, to achieve food security for all and to make sure that people have regular access to enough high quality food to lead active, healthy lives. Surely that's something that everybody can get behind. So thank you all again for being here. I will turn it over now to Hilal Elgar. Uh, she's a Global Distinguished Fellow with the Resnick Center um, and a 2009 SJD alumna of UCLA Law. And as uh, Michael Roberts mentioned, she is also the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food for the UN Human Rights Council. So thank you again for being here and welcome. Thank you very much, well, thank you very much uh, Dean, to uh, initiating or to cooperating with us for this uh, uh, good event and thank you for Promise Institute. Uh, we are hoping even in the future more cooperation promising right to food to everyone. So economic and social rights are not very popular in the United States. Maybe Promise Institute will give us a little bit more stronger entry in this country as Dean mentioned that we are not immune from the problems of the world. Uh, also, UK, for instance, recently became an important uh, kind of issue around the FAO or the Global Food uh, Policy Initiative that the developed countries are also seriously uh, in this uh, same problem. We are at the same boat, but of course, we are at the same boat in a different level. I'm talking about, for instance, the, when we talk about the famine, which is a very uh, problematic, extreme uh, poverty, uh, extreme uh, uh, food uh, uh, insecurity, which right now more than 30 million people are suffering. Since uh, World War II, 
uh, this uh, came again uh, to as a big uh, problem in the world, the reason of the conflict, especially Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East, and also uh, climate-related extreme uh, weather events. So we are, uh, uh, our distinguished speaker will even talk more, I don't wanna uh, uh, get to this, but unfortunately, instead of uh, decreasing the uh, hunger and the malnutrition, we are last three, four years, these figures are going uh, more higher, which is very, very unfortunate. So my role is here to give a little bit of a uh, uh, summary about the right to food and especially the uh, uh, a human rights approach to food security and policy, because we talk about the food policy, we talk about the food security, but what is the difference we are talking about human rights based approach? So it is my role as a special rapporteur trying to cooperate with other UN bodies, which most importantly FAO, dealing with the food insecurity issues, much more bringing the human rights based approach to uh, our uh, policies, because not every country is are accepting uh, this uh, 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 policy. Even the many countries accepting this policy, as 169 countries are uh, uh, ratified and signed uh, in, uh, economic and uh, social rights convention, but they're not doing their job. Nobody is doing their job really properly. So. We have to really talk about everywhere, in every uh, places about the right to food. So, uh, or human rights-based approach. For instance, when we talk about the human rights-based approach, I'm sure our uh, students here, uh, especially taking human rights uh, classes, they know well, but how do we make it right to food uh, policies? connected with the human rights uh, base. Uh, uh, there are a variety of ways to do that. It, uh, there is no only one way, uh, but there are four or five important structures that we keep talking about when we are visiting countries. As a special rapporteur, my role is basically uh, providing the information, knowledge, and at the same time, monitoring the countries whether or not they are following these rules and principles. So in order to do that, we go to mission trips uh, twice, uh, uh, two countries every year. And uh, now I think uh, I am special reporter since 2014, uh, almost uh, seven, eight countries I visited, specifically in uh, countries, and also we are doing I'm doing generally thematic reports twice a year. One is in New York, General Assembly Third Committee, which is the foundation of our uh, economic and social uh, covenant, and also Human Rights Council uh, in Geneva telling what are the major issues. For instance, we talk about the gender perspective. We, we can report about the climate change. We have report about the famine and conflict so forth, so on. We are giving the information, we are giving the knowledge, together, of course, with other UN organizations and NGOs and the private sector. Everyone comes together, deals with these issues, but at the same time, it, our role as a human rights council, as a special rapporteur on human rights, we are dealing with the violations of the specific cases. How countries are doing well or what are what, what is going on, some, uh, some countries are making a sort of a backwards, some countries are going forward. We try to make all these things kind of exposing every year. As you know, human rights are not, uh, especially economic and social rights, not as strong as the civil and political rights in terms of uh, courts and justiciability, but still, but we have to use this naming and shaming issues properly and strategically to stop some of the issues that is happening right now. So when I talked about the what is human rights based approach, the number one very similar, very, very easy. 
they, the countries, they have to have a certain kind of legal uh, structure on their own. I, I, international covenant is not enough because it's an international level. Countries should make the constitutional rules and principles internally. Or they, they don't have to do it directly with the constitution. Some, <coughs> they, uh, sometimes they do the framework law uh, to give the right to food is a kind of legal entitlement. That's the first step. But of course, you will say this is not enough. Implementation is important. There is a huge implementation that, uh, as I said, we have fantastic rules and principles, but the implementation level, we are having a serious problem everywhere. The second human rights-based approach is uh, participating in the decision-making process. Because in a democratic country, decision-making process <coughs> should be together with every stakeholders from civil society, private sector, uh, urban and rural, smallholder farmers, women, they all have to be together because everyone else, every group has a different kind of needs and interests, problems, and the solutions to the table. We need to bring the solutions to the table. So that's the second. The third one is, this, of course, this is con uh, continuation of the second. It has to be, these policies must be transparent, and state must allow for the free flow of communication, provide opportunities. So in this case, we, can, we have to tell that all human rights are connected. So if we don't have a freedom of speech, we cannot really deal with the right to vote. So these are the issues that governments should deal with. It. And the fourth is, more importantly, we need a strong court system, justiciability, which means the people that they, they feel that they are, uh, their rights are uh, under violation, they will be able to remedy in the court. This is a very important thing, especially policymakers should be accountable for adverse impacts of policies of the right to food uh, against their uh, citizens. So this is also part of my role to how to make accountable governments. So the final is the policy coherence. Policy coherence is not well known among the human rights the scholarship, but it is very well known among the UN families because we are doing different kind of uh, uh, issues for the same problem. FAO has a different role, UNDP has a different role, human, uh, different role, Human Rights Council, but we all have to be connected because when we talk about the right to vote, we have to deal with the environment, we have to deal with the gender, we have to deal with the very important problem of nutrition because right to adequate food, thank God in 1966, Article 11 gave us this small word, the adequacy, which we can put all the kind of uh, places which nutrition is universal epidemic right now that we are dealing with. So all these things are not easy because governments has a lot of competi uh, competing policies. Which policy should be more important? They should uh, focus on more trade, which generally they do, but this, uh, some of the trade policies are very detrimental for the people's right to food. So, but uh, not every state are doing really a uh, bad job. They are also good examples. And in our job, when we deal with these human rights violations, we also deal have to good practices. Governments always ask us, why you don't talk about the good practices, you always talk about the bad issues. So there are some good practices. And in these good practices, interestingly enough, the Latin American countries are the champion. So why they are Latin Americans are the champion in relation to good policies? So that's why I'm going to talk today about our Director General of the FAO, uh, Jose Graziano de Silva, because his role in this issue was very important and good example in Brazil. And 
of course I will call, uh, come later now there's a problematic development but let me introduce him uh, to you our distinguished speaker uh, Jose Graciano de Silva what he has been done in his life until today maybe he will tell us after um, after future what he would like to do that uh, he has a very distinguished career as an agronomist economist and a professor and he was able to combine these areas as an academic high level civil servant in Brazil and the highest international civil servant in his area of expertise this is a very special combination we cannot find all high level UN uh, mm -hmm. civil servant that kind of combination that's all that's a very important thing that I really uh, but of course I cannot give all the details about his uh, success but I can only give uh, some highlight <laughs> in his uh, long distance uh, long uh, distinguished career since 1977 uh, Graziano de Silva has devoted his effort to issues related to rural development and fighting hunger while working in the academia, at the political level and with organizer as a labor movement. That's important also. In 1978, Graziano de Silva became a full professor at the State University of Campinas and chair of the master's and doctoral program in economic development space and environment at the Unicamps Institute for Economics. As a professor, Dr. Graziano de Silva has been recognized for his valuable contribution to the training and preparation of a new generation of young Latin American professionals dedicated to rural development and food security. Graziano is the author of important publications on rural development, food security, and agrar agrarian economics in Brazil. He has published 25 books, some of them translated to different languages, but all of them, of course, Portuguese. And between 2003 and 2004, Graziano has, has a new a career. He was together with Luis, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, the famous Brazilian leader, unfortunately, he's in trouble right now, <laughs> and uh, Graziano was an extraordinary minister of food security. This is the first in the world. There is no food security minister until Graziano became in Brazil. So it is a very important first that we see here. And in this day together, they are responsible for implementing the zero hunger or Portuguese home zero. That was a kind of important program. On March 26, Graziano became an assistant director general of the FAO uh, in charge of the Latin America and the Caribbean. And he also promoted program all of same, dark rural issues and strengthen institutions and public policies and achieving comprehensive and inclusive development in rural areas. The development of rural areas are very important in relation to right to food. That's, we keep talking about this. And then Graziano finally was elected in 2011 <coughs> as uh, the first Latin American general director hold the position at FAO uh, in 2012, he started. He is one of the world's architect of the zero hunger concept, a powerful brand that is now reflected within the sustainable development goals, the UN's universal development goals for the 2030, maybe you know some of you, maybe not all of you, but specifically the goal number two is end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. It's a lofty, very large job. And since 2015, what is happening in this area is question mark. So uh, I heard that Graziano from here, he goes an important meeting 
dealing with this SDG tools. And my next report will be about this, how right to food could be implemented <coughs> under the SDG tool. Also, I'm, happy, I'm hoping that we're gonna work together because he's an expert on this area. Uh, to come back again to uh, Zero Fame program, in 2003, they launched the program uh, through uh, the uh, MOLAS, and he, in his inauguration speech, President Lula highlighted his tireless struggle to ensure the right of all Brazilians to food as a key goal to be accomplished. If in the end of my mandate, he says, all Brazilians will be able to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I will have an accomplished my lifetime mission. That's a very important thing because maybe 50% of the Africans don't have three times a foot. Some of them once a day a foot. Some of them every other day if there is a conflict. So it is a very important thing to push on this issue. <coughs> With subsequent uh, social policies, there's a Bolsa Familia, it's a very important social security issue, the cash transfer, putting <coughs> women in household in an important position, empowering the women in relation to right to food. So Brazil, with the success stories, managed to reduce the hunger 11% of its population in the early 2000s, very fast. And then in 2015, Brazil was no longer <coughs> part of FAO's hunger map. That was very, very important issue. Not only they make the food policy, but they implement human rights-based approach. They include private sector and the civil society. They give them a decision-making mechanism power. All was what we were talking about was that. Unfortunately, right now, the new <coughs> government, Brazilian government, is dismantling many of the good policies, which is very familiar for the United States also. But unfortunately, in Brazil, we are trying to expose the government what they are doing in a wrong way in, in Brazil. We hope we will be successful and they will stop and they will reverse to this negative impact. Graziano's effort, uh, effort was disseminating the Brazilian model to other places. Needless to say, first Latin American countries and the Caribbeans, he disseminated, and then he established Portuguese-speaking countries to first enter to African countries. And then he worked uh, very closely with the African Union. And in 2003, uh, 2013, they had this uh, Malobo Declaration to working together, ending hunger and reducing malnutrition by 2025. It was an important uh, policy, south-to-south -south communication rather than getting help looking in developing countries or overseas development policy. This is very different. He made the south-to-south -south connection very successful. Just a few days ago, uh, the African Union awarded uh, to Director General Jose Graciano da Silva for his passion for the Zero Hunger Vision and relentless leadership in that inspired Africa. It's very new. Congratulations on that. Just three, four days ago, I think. And uh, it is a, a what. Uh, the African Union chairperson noted that I'm reading, the right to adequate food can and must be part of the continent's reality. This is a very, very powerful sentence, especially from the African Union chairperson. It is not, this is a very good commitment. I hope it will go as it is, because in Africa, there are very good things are happening, but also home of the uh, highest malnutrition and the hunger is happening right now. Graziano also made in FAO open door policy, 
which is important, include the civil society and private sector was a fresh step in very bureaucratic, bureaucratic and state-oriented institution you should never imagine. So he also tried decentralized decision-making process. How is a giant knowledge collector, but hard to navigate in it. I am telling my personal experience, including physically in the building, the most difficult building you can ever move around. Mm -hmm. I must say, I had difficulty to reach Graziano because he was so much in demand and bureaucracy of the FAO is not easily breakable. I'm happy that we managed to do, to do that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jose Graciano de Silva has much to teach all of us. After his term is over, transmitting his experience and legacy at FAO is now one of his great patients. He is no stranger to the UC system. He had very good memories when he spent time postdoctoral degree in environmental studies, University of California, Santa Cruz, and then Berkeley. For the future, it will be an excellent opportunity for the UC campuses to invite him again as a professor to benefit from his knowledge and experiences sharing with our students. Without further ado, I think I talked too long. <laughs> Give him a but, but warm welcome to explain his life, what is going on there. Thank you. <laughs> Let me start uh, thanking Bilal for the generosity. Uh, and also thanking uh, the Dean, Jennifer, for her time. I know uh, that uh, when you do the things in your own house, it's much more difficult to stay all the time. So I thank you. And uh, special thanks for Michael Roberts that uh, has been with us in Rome, uh, in the, our legal office, uh, and uh, all the students and teachers, professors that are here today listen to me. Uh, in fact, uh, I am not uh, new in the region, let's say. Uh, only I'm coming back 18 years ago. Uh, I was here in Santa Cruz. Uh, for about seven, eight months, uh, doing a, a postdoctor with uh, Professor Dave Goodman at the time, working there. And uh, uh, I spend uh, a lot of my free time, let's say weekends, all of them, collecting the local experience on food security. Uh, we consider the time that California was ahead uh, of uh, almost all the states and Walden that we knew. And uh, many of the components of the Zero Hundred uh, project program uh, came from this region. And I can tell you a few of them, uh, like the local circuits of uh, uh, food production and uh, consumption of the local restaurants that was later called the, the kilometer zero produce. Also the organic farm, the, the ecological, the first ecological experience was in California, Santa Cruz, a small plot run by a professor there. And the most important, the basic input to the zero hunger uh, came from the food stamps, the way they applied here in the region. I went uh, around seeing how the, uh, at the time my, uh, I was, uh, my research was based on temporary workers in agriculture. Uh, and uh, uh, my PhD thesis was about that, uh, what is called in Brazil, boyish fears, what mean cold lunch, people that don't have how to uh, eat uh, proper food and in a proper way. 
so uh, I was looking how they were benefit from the, the, the food stamps program. And uh, I found that this was very interesting. And that was the basic input for and adapt. Uh, when you move from a reality to another, you need to adapt to succeed. And what we did, we gave, instead of uh, a, a coupon uh, to get the food from the supermarkets, as in our country, Brazil at the time, there were no supermarkets available, especially in the remote rural areas, we gave them cash. Uh, so, uh, in the cash, uh, we started to give by uh, the banking system. So, they started to enter in the banking system. But most importantly, uh, after uh, three months of uh, experience, we found out that to the, if we give the cash to the man, he would spend about 20 to 25 percent of the cash the moment he got it, until he get home. Uh, so we turn to give the, the, the cash to only to women. And the mother, if there was a mother available, if there was not a mother available, to the grandmother, there was no grandmother, to the daughter, always to the woman. And uh, I went to the Supreme Court uh, because I was accused of uh, uh, privilege for the women. <laughs> so, things that happen. But that is why I'm back here. Because, uh, you know, when we are in this moment of uh, very quick transformation of the technologies, new things, new products coming in, new ways of distributing, like the e commerce now, Amazon is. Sally Paulo was telling me that you could buy a salad uh, and uh, you can get it in your house and you can choose the components of the salad. Uh, and uh, when you look for that, you see that uh, what is lacking behind of this process that on the ground, on the productive base, is moving very fast, faster and faster accelerating what is lacking behind are the institutions. That is the problem, the way I see most of the conflicts nowadays in the world. Not only in the food system, that I will touch more close on that, but the, look for our democracy. How challenged are these new technology, fake news, news of the internet, all the communication is without, uh, 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 let's say, adequate legislation to cope with it or to regulate the system. This is exactly what has happened on food, on food systems. The food system has not been able to adapt. Our institution, I, I'm, I'm talking about university. I'm talking, I don't know much about this school of law. I hope that you could be one of the leading of this needs to improve and fill this gap that I see on regulation and institution. But I'm talking about the research system. I'm talking about the station service. What we are doing to cope with the impact of climate change. Very little. Look for the research system. We have been moving to global research systems. The CGR centers, we have one center for wheat, one center for maize in Mexico, one center for rice in Asia, and that's the way it's, uh, let's say, structured. And now, with climate change, we need to adapt locally, at the ground. It's, I'm not talking about uh, uh, country by country. I'm talking about in a country, the, the varieties of wheat that probably we will grow in California 
are completely different than the ones we are going to groom the East Coast. And things like that. So we are not prepared <coughs> at all to face, we institutions are not prepared at all to face the challenge. So let me uh, tell you what are the challenges that we in FAU believe that we are going to face. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with FAU. Uh, FAU was the first specialized agency to be created after the war, 1945. And it was a, a simple idea. Uh, if we have peace, we can eradicate hunger. There was a close association in our founders between conflict and hunger. Hunger was a product of the war, of the conflict. And in 1945, the devastated war, the idea was to promote rural development. What in fact uh, was done, particularly in Europe, where the, 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 the war uh, was uh, hosted, let's say. And uh, there was a lot of progress that FAO has been doing in this. We are now 74 years old. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, among this progress, one of the most uh, important was the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution, you probably have heard about a man, an agronomist named Norman Boulot. Norman Boulot was a breeding scientist uh, working in Chapingo in Mexico with uh, wheat and maize and discovered that the genetic could help improve yields. And especially if we put some inputs, like chemicals, to help this genetic to develop its potential. So it became, at the time, double the yields and the became super seeds, super production. And FAO took Norman Burrow to India. And he repeat what he did with uh, meat, with rice. And we took them for different places in the world. And we implemented the Green Revolution <coughs> around. Uh, well, the, it helped us to avoid hunger in the 60s. That was one of the biggest crises of production. Uh, it also helped us to avoid another crisis in 74, uh, when we had a problem of prices. Uh, and uh, uh, nowadays, we can say, proud of it, that we produce more than <coughs> enough that we need to feed the world. In fact, we, uh, let's say, if we look for the numbers, one third of all the food produced is wasted in different conditions, from the production to the consumer side. One third is too much. Too much. In spite of that, we still have hunger. And ironically, when we agreed with the zero hunger concept in 1970, uh, sorry, 2015, since we agree on that, hunger numbers have been increasing. We have now more than 120 million people hunger around the world. But uh, hunger is something that we know very well. Hunger now is associated with two main issues. One is conflict. We still have conflict. I, I, I believe that all of you have seen those pictures of Yemen. No? Different from the 70s, those pictures in the 70s were uh, not a, 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 a girl uh, it was a, a black woman uh, with children that uh, she could not feed, dying from hunger. Now is in Yemen, Muslim families that 
do not have access to enough food. Uh, well, uh, th this is the same reason, hunger. But in addition to that, now, we face another big challenge, that are the impacts of climate change. Like today, it was expected to rain. We wake up uh, 4.30 in the morning with uh, nine hours of jet lag. <laughs> and at six, we, uh, there was something open there that we got a coffee. And it, we decided to walk because it was going to rain at 10. <laughs> That was the last forecast. Three hours late, they changed completely the forecast. And uh, that's what has happened. With all the technology of it, in one of the most developed states of the world, we cannot forecast the weather for three hours. This is climate change. This is what happened, the impact of climate change. What the climate change introduced in our daily life is uncertainty. And this is something that's not compatible with food security. It's exactly the opposite. Food security is you need to have, you are sure that you have food to eat today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. And that is the challenge that climate change is posing on us. Uncertainty. We are back to the times where we were hunters. We wake up, we go out to see if we could collect a fruit or could find an animal to eat. Millions of years of agricultural development are upside down. And of course, this changed completely the work of an organization like a FAO. So what we are doing? Everything. Everything that we can. Including going back to the traditional knowledge of indigenous people to help us to understand what's going on. So in this moment, if you ask me what we are doing, everything that I can to help assure food security for the future. This is the big challenge that we have. But uh, in addition to that, I would say <coughs> that we're still looking for uh, feeding 9 billion people in uh, 20, 30 years more. What's well, not easy? Because said, okay, there is enough food now. With the impact of climate change, many reasons are stepping back. Africa. We have achieved auto sufficient in Africa, East Coast. Now, after six years of El Nino repeating, we have hunger back in Ethiopia. I just came from Ethiopia. Uh, four, four days ago, and hunger is back. Uh, because there are pro uh, draw year after year. And what I learned, uh, and uh, let me recall President Lula on this issue, that uh, uh, you cannot avoid a, a draw to happen, but you can avoid a draw to turn to family. And that is the point. And for that, what we need is much more uh, policies to be implemented. And there is where, again, institutionally, we are lacking behind. There are no policies being implemented, no enough policies being implemented to cope with those changes that we are facing uh, in this moment. Also, in addition to this need to, to feed more people, we need to reduce the environment impact of this production. The Green Revolution succeeded to produce more food. 
But at the same time, the intensive use of inputs, especially chemicals, affected uh, the uh, environment, especially uh, water and land. And uh, we cannot continue that way. And we cannot continue uh, devastating our forest. Our forests to produce more, using more land, we need to find new ways. So those are the big challenges that I would say we are facing nowadays, uh, and the uncertainties. But in addition to that, uh, there is something new. Uh, not only this paradox of uh, since we define the goal of zero hunger, hunger has been increasing, we have also a new paradox coming. Hunger is rising, but also obesity and overdose. I learned today that uh, even President Trump is uh, <laughs> under challenge now. <laughs> uh, obesity is everywhere, different from hunger, where it's concentrated on areas of conflict and where the climate change impacts. Obesity is everywhere, facing all countries, different people from young people, uh, children, women, etc. And we don't know what to do. We just don't know. We are just don't doing nothing. Even in certain areas of the world, Africa, for example, uh, overweight is synonymous of healthy people. Or in most of the countries, like my country, for example, uh, obesity or uh, overweight is uh, an individual problem. It's not a healthy problem. It's not a, a public issue. Even in the uh, plains, I live more in the plains than uh, in any other part. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give you an example, I said <coughs> four years, uh, four days ago I was in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Then I came back to Rome to, Rome, to see the pool, and uh, took the plane to Paris, uh, then took the plane to here. Tonight I'll be in where called Palm Spring. Palm Spring. <laughs> uh, spend the weekend in the seminar there. Monday I need to be in New York with the Secretary General because Venezuela is bringing us crazy. <laughs> uh, just that. So uh, one of the problems we have now in the plains is to sit on the side of all these men or women. <laughs> It's a real problem. A real problem. And we are not uh, taking that serious. You know that in the Pacific Islands, small islands, I uh, visited uh, last uh, January. I was in Fiji. Uh, the nearby uh, island was Tonga. And the Minister of Tonga was there to talked with me and said, well, we don't know if uh, 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 we are sinking because the sea level is raising due to the impact of climate change or due to the weight of our population. 70% <laughs> of the women in Toga are obese. 70% is an epidemic. Uh, if you look for the Caribbeans here near you, if you look at the U.S., hmm, this one of the main reasons of this is the export of food that is intensive in salt, sugar, and fats, and we don't have no regulation until now to deal with healthy food. We have some regulation that we do in FAO, the Codex 
are the targets that you are burning on, but to assure safety food. Not all food that's safety are healthy food. And we don't have one recommendation, one law, one international regulation to deal with that. We'll have a conference next April in the WTO World Trade Organization in Geneva to try to introduce this issue. I met already the DG of WTO to find a way that from food safety we move to food healthy food recommendations. Uh, but these depend very much on each country to regulate, to have their national diets, national standards, national recommendations. What they don't have moved enough. US is doing now, Brazil did some is a good example. There are a few countries I can count on my hands, the number of countries that have something. So this is where we are and uh, uh, where we need to go. My feeling is basically what we need is to move in direction of these healthy food, healthy diets. This is the new challenge. How we define it needs to be local, cultural based. Not all diets are equal. When I uh, have your age, long time ago, uh, my hero was Flash Gordon. I don't know if you have heard about it. <laughs> Flash Gordon used to travel to Mars, and uh, before taking the, the, the plane or the Sputnik, we call it, the, the tank, he take a pill that would keep him alive for a month. That was the goal of food. Appeal. It changed completely. Nowadays, you turn on the TV, there is a gourmet or someone cooking and telling you what you should do, and people are trying to get back this capacity of cook themselves. Because we, let's say, we sternalize the most important thing for our life that's food. We give them for the McDonald's, for the uh, supermarkets to decide what we eat. And we go there and buy them and came in microwave and that's it. No, that's not cooking. Uh, my grandmother knew what uh, uh, she was going to give us because she used to collect person in the backyard. I'm not asking to go back to those times. But I'm asking you that this needs to be treated not anymore as an individual issue, but as a public issue. Healthy food is a public issue. It's a food challenge. We need to move in this direction. And this is for you. This is for you. This is the biggest challenge, in my opinion. Our institutions are lucky behind the needs of nowadays. The new technologies are there. The impact on the food chain are there. It's a completely different way we eat nowadays than five, ten years ago. But the laws are the same. No. It's still considered a private issue, an individual product. But if you eat, how you choose? Even labeling is not agreed to alert you about what the, are the ingredients that are there. So this is your work. FAO will be very happy if we could find ways to work together. Because really, I believe that if we don't make good progress in short time on these issues, the things will get worse and worse. It is not about hunger anymore. It's all forms of malnutrition. Many of them are impacting in a way that we never see. Estimates we made with the World Bank and WHO says that uh, malnutrition costs nowadays about 
3.5 trillion dollars yearly. You know what is that? This is about 3% of the world's uh, product, gross product. This is more than the money that is spent on conflicts and terrorism combat, just for you to have an idea. And it will grow more, much more. Because, OK, hunger is growing, but not as fast as obesity. If I ask, where is obesity growing fast? Any of you would answer Africa? I doubt. That's there. Where obesity is growing fast. So these are the challenges we're facing. And this is what we need to look for. I will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you. to full approach says that uh, we uh, should have a healthy food for all. I think this is the, the link that we have. Uh, not only provide food or any way of uh, providing food, but providing a health food. Uh, also it says that should be uh, according to the culture according to the, uh, let's say, the different regions, etc. So I think that uh, the right to food approach gives you the opportunity to address that. Uh, how I see is that uh, we still have a lot of resistance from our uh, superstructure mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, still believe that this is an individual issue. It's not for the state to decide what you're going to eat. This is what uh, uh, is usually the answer that you got when we venture that way. It's not to the state to decide what is a healthy food or not. But it's for the state to pay for the consequence of it. And uh, so we need to find a compromise. We need to find a way that this become a policy issue. I think that uh, we need uh, to find ways how to regulate that. Uh, of course, we need to be in a democratic way, find ground to, to how to define the healthy food, healthy diet. Uh, but uh, if we don't move in that direction, we will not make any progress. It also in the uh, right to food. Thank you. I, I have a question uh, to ask. And maybe this is a question for Paul and for you, Director uh, General. One of the questions in our law class is, what's the United States' approach to right to food? Uh, a, does, it, does it recognize it? And if so, how? And if not, why not? Well, uh, we all know uh, Director General, even a longer historical period in relation to FMO and how uh, right to food developed there, the United States from the day first was against uh, this could be the economic and social rights, not only right to food, which Article 11, we talk about the housing, health, 
and education, all kind of livelihood of the people, which is you know, a little bit of answering your question. Uh, the U.S. perspective is this should be a policy rather than the rights, uh, as opposed to civil and political rights, because civil and political rights, uh, states uh, should uh, much more responsible uh, to give individuals that kind of right, but these are much a rather negative way uh, to explaining the human rights uh, approach. And also United States uh, has a, a, a general idea about the human rights issues that should be more national, nation level rather than the federal level. But when you make this convention it become the federal system, uh, then the states cannot really move around that kind of social policy. So there are a variety of reasons that why the uh, United States uh, is not accepting uh, right to food and other economic social rights equal to the civil and political rights. And it became, of course, uh, the political issue during the Cold War period. Because the, uh, Graziano remembers very well in Cold War period, there was two sets of the states. The, uh, the Western part was pushing the civil and political rights, and the uh, Eastern part, uh, the basically Soviet, were pushing economic and social rights. It's a historical background yeah. by the US. I shouldn't go too much further on that, but there are mixture of issues that U.S. is reluctant. This doesn't mean that U.S. doesn't do anything, but it is not a legal entitlement. That's the difference. Thank you. Um, do you want me to arbitrate the questions, and then that way you don't have to call on people? Um, Dr. Lustig? You know? I want to pick up on a point you highlighted, and that is that there's no definition of healthy food. So I have a question related to that. Which is worse, no food or bad food? No food causes war, bad food causes obesity, health care uh, 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 costs, and societal devolution. Which is worse? I would argue that we've traded one disease for another, and FAO actually is in the epicenter of it. By trying to fix hunger with bad food, we've gotten a whole different host of diseases because the only thing that works is healthy food. So the question is, what is healthy food? In fact, Brazil knows, because the Brazil Dietary Guidelines outlined it. Your colleague, Carlos Montero, very specifically in the Brazil Dietary Guidelines, said what people should eat. So why is it so hard for FAO to adopt this? We have the definition. If you want, I can read it to you. Uh, that is the problem. Uh, it's only a definition. And so broad that does not translate into concrete uh, actions. What uh, Carlos Montero did was adapted to the Brazilian conditions. We have a broad this definition to contemplate. FAO has 197 countries on board. It's very difficult to address this issue in a very specific manner. In addition to that, it's not about only FAO uh, definition. We are responsible with WHO on these uh, healthy diets. We have been working on that since 2014. And uh, most of the time, what we agree, our members disagree on. I'll fix your definition for you in two seconds. Healthy food is fiber-containing food, and unhealthy food is fiberless food, processed food. That's the difference. And that's true for 197, actually it's true for all 209 countries. Because anywhere the Western diet's been adopted, these diseases have followed. In an attempt to try to fix hunger, which I understand and I'm for, we have instead levied processed food on these people because it's cheaper and in the process have actually created a bigger problem. You touch a, a, a dimension that is uh, no doubt important, fiber. 
is not the only one. Uh, we have a, a lot of other components also. We can have uh, a product, for example, uh, with high level of fiber, but uh, also high level of sugar. So well, if it's okay. if it's got high level of fiber and high level of sugar, it's not real food. It's been processed. In which case, then soluble fiber has been added, not insoluble fiber. You need so both. If it was fruit, okay. it would have so both. You have added a, a, another component: fiber, no process. Certainly, the U.S. would block this definition. In FAO, they did. Well, that's why there hasn't been any movement. That's why I'm saying that the problem is on this superstructure. So this is the a way political problem, not a food problem. Well, uh, everything is political. Uh, food is a political issue, no doubt. Uh, but what I'm saying is that we need to find mechanism, decision mechanism, to take action. Like the, uh, I mentioned in the beginning, there's nothing more political than fake news. We need to find a way to fix it. Let's be honest. It's not about the United States blocking it. It's about the food industry blocking it. No, it's blocking I, it all over the I, world. I fully agree. That's the food. I, I just gave the example because it happened. I just gave the example immediately, not saying because the U.S. No, no. The uh, U.S. has been uh, the, one of the uh, very important countries dealing with very innovative ways, including the only experience that we have until now, now <coughs> it is uh, uh, adopted a policy against obesity in children and succeed is New York uh, in U.S. So uh, I'm not uh, blaming U.S. I'm uh, saying, giving you an example how difficult it is for us to deal with these new things that we don't have enough ground base so. Other questions? Yes. Um, thank you for your talk. You mentioned at one point that you weren't suggesting we go backwards to growing our own food. But I wanted to ask you about this. Uh, since we're facing such political and economic uh, uh, rejection of the ability to move forward with serving healthy food to the world, what would be so horrible about having structures built with dirt on the roof, with, with soil on the roof, where societies did grow their own food. What would be so terrible about that? Uh, well, uh, I was very clear that I was not advocating that uh, all of us grow our own food. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but uh, uh, if I can give some example uh, mm -hmm. that apply this concept for you. Uh, the cities now are starting to be uh, part of uh, food production. What was uh, something that uh, we only had in the beginning of the Mesopotamia was that way. The agriculture was inside uh, the walls mm, to protect them. And now again we started to have this uh, food, uh, fruits, vegetables, etc., that uh, are part of the peri-urban areas. And we started to have the mayors promoting uh, farmers to come and have their markets inside the cities, etc. So uh, this is a big change. Mm -hmm. We started also to have uh, differentiate uh, the rules for let's say, uh, sport of food or to s sell it locally. There are different uh, patterns, different regulations to fill. So all this means that in some sense we are, let's say, something that we have externalized completely, uh, we are starting to uh, take it back. That was the meaning of what I said, produce our own food. I can tell you that uh, sometimes it's possible. Uh, I live in Rome now, seven years, and uh, I produce my own uh, cow. Uh, 
because we use that in feijoada, that's a traditional Jewish Brazilians, and we don't have it in Rome. So uh, I grow it in my terrace. Uh, many people are doing that with some different in different conditions, but uh, it's possible. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, tension with the superstructure and getting more right to food and access to food. And it sounds like there's an economic component to it with major food. What's the strongest economic argument in addition to the one you mentioned about the trillion dollars and the percent of the global product that you have in support of your position? Well, uh, we have now uh, the food market, basically. Uh, we have two big, uh, I would say, components of that. One are the commodities. Mm -hmm. uh, ship food available for export, long distance, etc. And then we have another non-commodity uh, market uh, that are most of the local products, fruits, vegetables fresh food. Uh, and this uh, also uh, is a, an economic differentiation. So uh, as the commodities are cheaper food and are basically cereals, uh, the poor eat more commodities than the rich. They eat more, uh, let's say, uh, differentiated food or specific food or local food. Uh, this is uh, becoming a big problem because as uh, we progress in the economy and uh, increase uh, our earnings, uh, we are spending less and less uh, money with food. Uh, nowadays in the U.S. we spend about 5 to 10 percent only on food. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, we used to spend 30 percent. Uh, so, uh, food is becoming uh, something insignificant from the economic point of view for those people that are rich. But for those people that are poor, uh, said they only have access to this unhealthy food. And this is one of the problems that we are seeing growing obesity and overweight, especially among poor people. It's unbelievable, no? Uh, the poor are obese, not hungry anymore. Well, uh, we basically work uh, with uh, small farmers. We prefer to call them family farmers, uh, because usually they work with their family on that. In fact, FAO and uh, IFA are responsible for implementing the decade of family farming that started this year, 2019. 10 years. We are launching the decade in May in our headquarters in Rome. If you cannot come, uh, there will be all around the world events to celebrate this launch during the May and June. Uh, we wanted to that to promote two main ideas. One, that the small farmers are responsible for the food we eat or a big part of the food we need, not all, but an important part. But also that the small farmers can help to preserve biodiversity. And this is a big concern we have nowadays. We are losing the biodiversity. More and more we are concentrating what we need in a few crops and products. In the past, 
humanity used to feed based on about 7,000 different products. We have brought it down for 100 now. And among the five of them is 90%. And if you take the wheat, it will respond about 30 and 40% of all intake we have in the world. And we, the bread that you eat, the muck pasta that you eat, hmm? all this is becoming more and more unhealthy because wheat is one of the crops most affected by the impact of climate change. Do it to a mechanism that uh, will take a long time to explain it. Uh, but uh, uh, the wheat growing in high temperatures and with intensive uh, of uh, CO2, uh, it produces much more carbohydrate than protein. And cannot fix also zinc and many vitamins. So when you eat, uh, Eat nowadays, you are eating more and more carbohydrate than before. Uh, estimates that we have shows that uh, this can be uh, a changing game in wheat and accentuate uh, reaction like uh, idiot disease and uh, allergic issues. So it's urgent to find a substitute. For wheat, for wheat, and we are talking about 30 to 40 percent of intake on carbohydrates in the world. Not easy. Well, we are out of time. <laughs> There's a lot of questions, um, and I apologize, but we've got a bit of time to, Professor, I'd like to summarize for sure. us here in conclusion. But thank okay. you My so pleasure. much. We really enjoyed having you here. I tell you, you must be an expert in a lot of different fields to do your job. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Well, I mean, I think we owe an enormous debt of thanks to Director General Graciela da Silva and to Special Rapporteur Hilal Alvar for their very rich presentations, which makes it incredibly difficult with the whatever it is, three minutes, two minutes that I have, <laughs> to provide an overview uh, and summary. But there were a few things I thought were worth really underscoring about um, what we might take away, particularly for a university audience from these presentations. The first was that there was a clear emphasis on the local and the global and the importance of their intersection. Uh, you heard in Dean Manukin's remarks, um, the US statistics, and I'll just say for LA County, that we are in a circumstance where over 29% of, of households in Los Angeles County face food insecurity. And at the same time, we've seen a doubling of obesity amongst adults and a tripling of obesity amongst children in this county, uh, rising to levels of 22 and 23% obesity, respectively. So food insecurity and obesity, the two sides of the coin that we've been looking to this discussion of, reside here immediately um, around us. And we exemplify the very challenges around processed food and uh, combating poverty and, and hunger with the wrong kinds of foods and so forth that you might see anywhere else in the world. So it's a starting point of the location that we find ourselves in. But then we also heard a great deal about the global ranging from Yemen's famine to circumstances in Gaza to East Africa, what we're seeing worldwide, 30 million uh, people facing extreme food insecurity at the level of famine, was what Director General uh, Graziano de Silva uh, laid out for us. And we also saw at the connection the fact that a place like California or the United States is both the source of many of these problems in the exchange that we heard around processed food and these solutions that the United States have backed amongst others of exporting processed foods worldwide, but also that this has been, and quite locally, a source of tremendous innovation. So we've seen the emergence of localism as a movement. We've seen organic farming uh, really pioneer dramatically. We've seen the food stamp program and other efforts to address extreme um, food insecurity in urban areas through creative means of generating some kind of subsidy structurally, even in a country that refuses to recognize the right to food. So all of this taken together raises a set of questions, I think, about what a university can do. And as I am the faculty director of the Commons Institute for Human Rights, it seems appropriate to think about this through the lens of how might a university human rights program um, address and begin to address some of the things that we've just heard. The first thing that really strikes me is that while food was at the center of the discussion, we heard about environment. We heard about migration. 
We heard about gender. We heard about technology. And there's an enormous array of different foci that really have to be addressed through a human rights lens in order to begin to think about what solutions might be. That actually is very convenient <laughs> from the perspective of our strategic planning at the Promise Institute for Human Rights, because these are also the foci that we have. So we want to think very differently and innovatively about how to address human rights, particularly in a country where it has been overwhelmingly thought of through the civil and political rights lens. So one, for example, area of interest for us is environment and human rights. And while this has meant, amongst other things, working with the Emmett Institute, which is our institute here on environmental law, it also means working with Resnick and thinking about all the ways in which climate change and environment may be impacting the possibility of human rights. And I could replicate the story for you with migration and the Center for the Study of Migration here, with gender, with technology. These are the areas that we want to look at. And what I take away from the discussion we've had today is that these are the right areas to look at to be able to understand the kinds of accountability challenges. And another area that I think we're very interested in and that many of our students are interested in is business and human rights. And we heard about corporate accountability as another area that would be very important if you think about the role that the food industry might play both as an actor and as a lobbyist. And thinking about broadly what accountability means from a human rights frame is, I think, an important challenge rather than focusing narrowly on um, traditional areas of accountability, like, for example, war crimes and so on, which are also incredibly important. But there are these underlying structural stories around economic and social rights. And I think only by looking at the intersection of a number of focal areas can we really begin to think innovatively about solutions. Which takes me to the third and last thing that I will say by way of both sort of thinking um, synthetically about what we've heard and also conclusion, which is as a university, how can we contribute to knowledge production in this area and the dissemination of that knowledge? We heard that the FAO is an amazing repository for information, but it might be difficult for the special rapporteur, let alone the average citizen, to understand how to access that knowledge and that information. So the first thing that a university can do is really begin to try to address that question. We too are in the business of knowledge production, and the question is how can we effectively partner, for example, with an institution like the FAO, so that we can both increase the production of knowledge itself, but also access and dissemination. So that's been an important area of focus for us in thinking about how do we build institutional partnerships and what is the added value that we can bring in doing that as a university. Uh, and partnerships with external institutions is one area. Another important area is intramural partnerships within the university. And you see this event in our collaboration with Resnick as a clear example. But one thing that we see very clearly in Director General Graziano da Silva is sometimes a single person can exhibit all the expertise necessary. They can be an agronomist and an economist, a policymaker and a diplomat. But that's not very common, as uh, the special rapporteur made clear in her introductory remarks. Oftentimes, a single person isn't both a lawyer and an agricultural expert and an expert in information sciences and an expert in health and so forth. So how do we build the interdisciplinary relationships at a university like this one, at a major research university, that really leverages what we're doing here? And we've begun to try to think about that. One of those partnerships, of course, as you've seen, is with Resnick. Another one is <coughs> information sciences here at UCLA where we are trying to think about how do you make knowledge accessible? How do you archive things? How do you generate databases? What do you do to make it possible for the average person to make use of all the great kinds of research that happen at a university like this one? And again, this discussion persuades me that solutions have to be interdisciplinary. That means partnerships have to be built. And the information that emerges has to be made digestible. We have a job to do to take research and the important results that it produces and turn it into policy-ready vehicles, but also vehicles that are informative and empowering for those that are our audiences. Which brings me to the last thing and the greatest wealth of the university, which is students. Of course, and faculty and staff, but primarily students and the community that we draw to us. How do we leverage the incredible capacity that all of you bring, that brings you even on a Friday afternoon to hear <coughs> about important work like this? And so um, at the Promise Institute, and I will close with this, I really have to thank all of you for being here and then invite you to join us in a 